before everything, all of these web technologies were popular, he was actually working on building those things. So that's when I got really into it and I started asking him questions like, oh, what are you doing? How do you get into this stuff? So yeah, this is basically what he had done. He actually had made a full-on open source uh, whiteboard app as well. I can actually probably demonstrate it here. started building this when he was in like class 11 or something. Uh, this is built on Tori and uh, JavaScript. Have any of you maybe heard of Tori? Okay, so uh, it's an open source uh, project and essentially what it does is it, it, allow, it allows you to run web technologies like uh, React, JavaScript and stuff like that on, uh, you know, on the mm -hmm. desktop. So you can compile, uh, you can create apps for like Windows, Mac and Linux. So, this is the, the right now I'm running on a Mac, but he also compiled it for Linux and Windows. So it's very, it's a really simple app. But uh, yeah, just this, this the the fact that he was he was still in in school and he's building all of this you know amazing tech. That's what really got me interested. So going back to the slideshow, that's what really you know got me. Okay, fine, I need to just get my hands into this. So. So then we started a, a GitHub organization. So this is called uh, Kushar Gonkar, quite a uh, funny name, but uh, we started this and uh, we started to build a couple of bots. So you can see, uh, has any, have any of you guys used Discord maybe? Yeah. So Discord has, they, uh, they have an API where you can create bots, you can interact with the, the software. So uh, this was during the COVID time when we were all online. So we had this Discord server where we would be sharing notes and you know talking because we couldn't meet. So all the techie ones were like, okay, fine, let's extend Discord. You know, we'll add a couple of features. Like um, there was a feature where if you would you could text the bot and it would send a DM to everybody in the server. You know, an important message so that you don't miss it. Stuff like college and uh, school announcements and stuff. We also implemented features like um, if a message came over to WhatsApp, it would pick it up from there and paste it on Discord. So we interacted with both the WhatsApp API and the Discord bot using Python and we got that to work. So that was all pretty interesting stuff that I uh, see seven of us were working on this. We just made a couple of bots. There was even a music bot that we created so that uh, students could just sit in the voice call on Discord and just like, listen to music. So this was a lot of fun. Learned a lot, I especially a lot about web technologies how uh, you know creating servers work, JavaScript, Python, and stuff like that. Yeah, so this is where now my uh, thing starts. Uh, I worked with him and you know the others on these projects, but then I had to learn something of my own, right? So I picked the Mon stack. Uh, Mon stands for Mongo, Express, React, and Node.js. So this is a uh, this stack is completely built on JavaScript. So if any of you guys you know want to get into uh, making websites or making web apps, I would definitely suggest picking up a language like JavaScript and then working your way up by learning these open source technologies. All of these are open source technology, except, uh, it's not very visible on the screen, but yeah, except Mongo, which is the, the database, that is open, that is source available, not open source. From my understanding, uh, it's not, free and open source but the source code is available you can't really uh, I think you can't really make modifications to it but at least you can see what's happening in the background so so that's that uh, I had an idea actually I don't know whether I should mention this but I mean well uh, the idea was to build like a social platform where uh, you know it's like a custom Google map where you could create your own routes put your own reviews pictures maybe so say for example a friend because I've got these questions 
uh, a lot. I'm, I study in Manipal and th when, when, whenever someone asks me uh, where you're from and I say I'm from Goa, the first question is like, oh, tell me what's good in Goa, where the good beaches are, you know, uh, where to stay, all of that. So I thought, why not create a huge map, some kind of software where I can now drop pins that I want, um, maybe put custom reviews, draw like, you know, a route map, stuff like that. And I know you can do stuff like this on Google Maps, but it's very restricted. And also Google Maps is built, you know, with like sponsorships in mind, like a lot of uh, things can promote their own places. I wanted none of that. I wanted only, you know, what I feel like is a good place to go, no matter if the ratings are good or not on Google Maps. So that's something I started working on. It's incomplete right now because of, you know, the stuff I started to do after this. But uh, yeah, this is what I started to build. This is my, this is my first project. Uh, yeah, so then college days, you know, got to college. This is me actually in a workshop uh, held by the coding club in uh, in my college. So any of you guys part of the coding club in your college or university? Yeah. Uh, you guys, you guys, you guys have clubs, right? I think. Uh, so, no, that was a good experience. I joined the coding club there, and uh, yeah, they started to teach me all the, the basics and stuff. Yeah, and that's when um, Manipal OSF began. So, I'll first tell you what exactly this is. Manipal OSF was uh, built to fill a void that we saw in our university. So, just like how you know we have FOSS, FOSS United, which has you know meet meetups like this. We wanted um, something in college where people could come and discuss open source. So, OSF stands for Open Students Forum where uh, students, we, we come, we just keep talking about, you know, tech like this. It's similar, similar type of meetings. I'll just show you in the next slide, actually. Uh, a meeting that we had had. So, yeah, this is the team. This, these are the people who had showed up. This is a meeting we had a couple of months ago. Um, and somebody there. So, yeah, a lot of interesting people, a lot of enthusiastic students. Uh, we have organized meetings like this in the conference room where they can, they can just talk. Um, we made them go sit in like small groups, discuss some ideas, and then had like somewhat of a like a pitch competition where each group would come talk about some good software that they would you know want to build. Uh, and then what we did is we took all the good ideas and we made a GitHub organization, which I can probably show you. I think. But okay, you can see the literature. So this is an LWU uh, that stands for Learning with Us. So what we did is, uh, since a lot of people were asking, okay, how do I learn JavaScript? Or how do I learn GitHub? I don't know how to use Git. It's really confusing. Uh, created a bunch of open and free uh, wikis on GitHub. You can actually just go and check them out. They're not locked to our university or anything. And just guides to you know GitHub, JavaScript, stuff like that. So it has a full roadmap and an end assessment as well. So these are things that you can, you know, we build it all for the students. So a lot of the first year, second years. Once they found this, they were like, yo, this is a really helpful. Oh yeah, and another statistic. Uh, so we have, we also have a, a site on SharePoint. I can't show that now because um, I don't have, I haven't logged in. But uh, it's that SharePoint site is only for the university because it's you know built on a, on our university tenant. But there we were posting you know useful materials and even college notes and stuff like that. And the statistic is, at one point, I think we peaked at around 6,000 users using, uh, you know, 6,000 um, unique users, and we got like around 80 to 90,000, you know, accesses to the server per day, because especially d during like the end sem times or the holidays when people were going to learn stuff. So that's when we knew, okay, fine, this is actually working, right? Our site with all of the notes and all of the learning material, it's actually getting some traction. So. Now I've been rambling for a long time, but now I'll get to where you know all this all of this leads. We saw that all of this stuff was working in the school, and we thought, fine, we as students are doing something that even the university maybe hasn't accomplished the way we have. Students are coming to our site instead of going to the professors for notes or instead of you know um, checking out YouTube videos. They're like they're coming to me and asking for you know how to program in this, how to program in that. So we, we thought, why not build the entire tooling and infrastructure for universities? Um, and that's actually when I started a company. Now, of course, we are at a FOSS group meeting. I'm not going to pitch my company here. But uh, I'll explain how we incorporated FOSS you know, uh, into our products. So 
we started a company essentially we are building uh, you know apps and software for universities so management of like uh, students uh, grades and attendance notes stuff like that but what we are doing different from you know the thousands of other companies who are already in this field is that we are creating we are extending proprietary solutions using open source so um, i'll show you microsoft example which we have created here this is the don't uh, you know to look at the ui it's the work in progress but what we did essentially is we took the microsoft ad which is their entire ecosystem of um, they have you where you can log in you know you have your tenants you have your roles and all of that the entire back end of microsoft what we did is we took that and instead of using their legacy proprietary uis you know like sharepoint ui or uh, like teams i mean even teams is pretty modern but it's clunky and we thought okay it's not open source it's not very customizable let's make something completely open source so this app which is there actually it's completely open source on github right now but again using open source itself i think uh, we use nextjs anybody familiar with nextjs so you mean by microsoft ad mm -hmm. the back end that micro that most or 95% of colleges are using as a back end for their yeah. management software mm -hmm. and that is extended using open source yeah exactly so uh, i wish i could show you what the nav of ad looks like and actually i can give an example it looks like a windows xp software like it's it is literally built in during the windows xp days and it hasn't been updated since and we can't do anything about it because it's completely proprietary so we took on the task of doing that we started building apps and uh, software you know to extend all of these really powerful uh, you know enterprise software using their open apis create our own you know customizations and plugins on top of that so there i mentioned office plugins as well that's another thing is a pipeline we are planning on making open source uh, excel plugins word plugins so that you could extend what is already you know possible on excel or on word so to give an example um a lot of a lot of universities use excel to take attendance right i think uh, university students they do you guys use excel do the professors use excel and stuff like that probably they take excel and then they manually go to whatever you know whatever site that the university university is using for updating the attendance and they have to manually update it there any professors will know how tedious it is to you know maintain a log book a register and all, all of that so what we are doing here is we build we plan to build an excel plugin uh, that will take all the data and actually push it to whichever server that you want and since it's open source and we will have a lot of documentation any administrator for college can come look at our thing and be like okay fine we want to uh, you know tweak it in a such a certain way so that it fits our needs sure you can guys you guys can do that so yeah uh, i'll actually demonstrate what this does right now So, um, to avoid going to avoid becoming too technical, uh, I'll just briefly explain what directory extensions are on the Microsoft platform. So, uh, what they have is essentially um, your in Microsoft AD you have a list of properties that you can use. I think there are nine properties by default, um, and that's for business because you know all of this stuff is built for enterprise. So it's sufficient for you know any businesses that want to run, but if we are extending this for universities we need a lot more properties right a student might have uh, properties like their grades their attendance you know which year they are in which batch they are in which uh, courses they are in so many other details even like medical records parents details all of that microsoft already has a platform called directory extensions where you can extend all of the stuff that they have on azure but the issue with that is it's only an api there's no ui for it and since it's only an api only programmers will be able to extend this not your you know your average administrator in, in the university so 
we realized fine, we need to start building a UI for that. So this is our first iteration. Uh, clearly, it's not much of a UI, um, but this is what this is the work in progress. Right now, we can access. Like I'll just show you. See, we have created these. These are the users. Uh, so we can assume these has to be students. Students can have multiple groups. So you know, you have similar stuff like uh, you know, electronic communication systems, uh, essentials of management, basic reinforced concrete design. So these are all the courses that they could be part of. Obviously, you're not going to have these you know properties in your regular Microsoft Azure. But we are extending Azure itself with all of these problems. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Now, yeah, I can show you the, the user properties. So I told you there were nine in the start. We have added so many. And this is the reason why we have done this is because education has like a, a standard that we have to comply to, a data, data standard. And the, the regulation says that this much information needs to be collected of a student. So we were like, where do we put this, right? So we decided to extend Azure for this reason. So we have all of the data there. And groups also have data types like type, program, department, stuff like that. So I'll wrap up by saying uh, what we have done is essentially instead of building up a software from the ground up, we have just leveraged open source and leveraged the community to take existing, uh, you know, existing solutions that may be, you know, somewhat difficult to use because of their proprietary nature, and just wrap that and uh, extend that using open source technologies to make that a more, a lot more accessible. So yeah, that's what we're doing. Uh, hope I didn't bore you with the long technical talk, but uh, yeah, any questions for me? So user creation would be from this panel or I mean it's still part of Active Directory services they will create a user and then add these components to that particular user in Active Directory like how does that? So we have, so, so what, what, here what I'm showing you is the open source tool that we created just to extend the Active Directory. Not this, you will create users and stuff. This is completely open source just to extend. There's actually, this is, okay, this is the browser. I can, I'll actually show you what we're building for exactly what we said. Uh, this is our website and here. So you're building uh, another open source platform, which, you know, it, it allows you to create courses, register students. So this is essentially like a template on top of Azure itself, but makes it really easy for administrators to access, uh, you know, Microsoft's huge stack. That is what we're aiming for. We, we want, we are, we are not thinking of from the student side. By thinking from the administrator side or the teacher side, because they are the ones who drive adoption, not the students. If the if your professor forces you to use the software, you have to use it. But if the professors find the software too hard to use, right, because of the learning curve, that's where that's the problem that we are trying to tackle right now. So we're building these open source uh, tools on top of uh, you know difficult to use software to get it up and going. Uh, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? I just missed the first two minutes of your recording, so if you could just uh, say it in a summary, just the first two minutes. Okay. Uh, the part, um, like the start of yeah, my Yeah, they start. Sorry, yeah. sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. So, uh, yeah, in summary, basically, I am a student in uh, uh, Moshifan Aryan's High Secondary School, and my journey in open source and tech in general begins there, where I met a bunch of colleagues. Uh, uh, notably, you know, Harsh Kande Parker and a few others who we uh, we formed a group, we started to exchange ideas and eventually that led into the birth of a GitHub organization where we have a bunch of projects um, built in Python, JavaScript. Projects that we didn't really build, you know, to sell or to showcase to someone, but just for our own needs. So we leveraged, you know, open source tools directly to build stuff that we wanted to make. So, yeah. How do you take this forward now? So, the, I, I feel like the uh, it should begin like that. It should, you should build stuff that you want to use. Not stuff that, okay, I'm building this for money or something like that. Just like, you know, the previous speaker had mentioned, okay, I need a, a good password manager uh, because the proprietary ones are really bad. So, maybe I'll either take an open source one or I'll make one my own or I'll extend another open source because that's the beauty of open source, right? We can, the source is available. So, so exactly in that way, if you have a, a problem 
in your community that you need to fix. I would suggest instead of you know building a proprietary app that you would have to manage, which is pretty impossible for us as students. Make it open source, publish it on GitHub, and spread the word amongst your community, especially you know the tech community. And you'll be surprised how many people show interest. Like I showed you the image of uh, of, of the of the Manipal OSF meetup. There were like around 30 people there who just showed up, and you know everyone's throwing around ideas, and everyone's like, I want to build this, I want to build that. You know, give us a platform to do that. Um, so yeah, a lot of students are interested in building software and they might be interested in your idea as well and that's how I would say collaborate with students, collaborate with uh, people in the tech world and uh, yeah, you can take your project off the ground. You heard of uh, Nextcloud? Nextcloud? Um, not exactly. Because Nextcloud, I'm not sure if they, are, they have an active directory service component, right? But they are like an equivalent or a, uh, I mean, they offer what Google Drive and all mm -hmm. this kind of service around yeah. Google Drive that they offer. So maybe that's something that mm -hmm. I'm guessing you all could explore since you're doing it from a student's perspective. Yeah, right? I think uh, um, Nextcloud was amongst the uh, services that we were luckily looking at, okay. like what do we extend. But the reason why we stuck with, uh, with this is because, uh, as Karan just said, almost 90% of universities and colleges are already using either Google Classroom or Microsoft uh, you know, services. So we thought we can't really disrupt the market using some new shiny thing. Instead we stick to what's working and we improve of that and that's how we sell. Lance, you almost suggested that open source is uh, free and open source is more convenient for students. Why is so why? More convenient for students. Oh yeah, it's, it's a better fit. It's easier for them to enter. Is this your case? In the world is real? Yeah, because, uh, okay, if I were to talk about the, the flip side, where, okay, I want to work on a proprietary software. Um, like, how do you do that? Say, I want to work on, um, on I don't know, uh, any proprietary software, like Unity, for example. It's a game engine. It's proprietary. Um, the source is unknown. To get to work there, I would have to apply it for the job and somehow get the job after going through a series of interview process and stuff like that. But open source on the flip side, all you have to do is open GitHub or wherever they're hosting their Git repository, go to the issues, see if uh, such a one that you find interesting. And for those who you know are actually actively looking forward to this, there are issues tagged as uh, good for first time contributors. So you can, you can go and do those, they're usually documentation issues uh, and such, easy stuff. But then you can start there. So um, yeah, to answer your question, Open source becomes easier because the barrier to entry is less than, you know, working on closed source software. If we are talking about working for someone else's software, if we are talking about working on your own software, then initially both have the same difficulty because closed source software just means you're only working on it or small team. But as you start scaling, then you realize, okay, I need a lot more people. Then you need to work either hire people, create a company, you know, all of that issue. Instead, open source it, and you'll see the community just coming in, you know, using your software, and then eventually you'll have 50, 60, 70 contributors who are doing the job for free just because they want to use the software. So that's why I I feel that open source becomes easy for students to, you know, leverage. What about licensing? What did your license the software that you're building in? So uh, already, the uh, one that you were just demoing. The one that I just showed you. And for my uh, listing, and that's in, on on the MIT license. Yeah. Uh, this stuff, actually, this we haven't licensed yet. It's kind of being built. That's why I can't demo it to you. Uh, but we do intend to use the most open license. Um, in fact, like I know I don't know if I should mention this now, but I was looking at like copyleft licenses. If that are familiar with copyleft, but uh, saw a lot of issues with that. Especially, I read an article where Google's uh, Google employees were suggested or they were recommended to not use copyleft software because essentially what copyleft means, and I know I'm digressing, but uh, it means that the software that I'm using right now or the the code that I'm giving you is open source and has to remain open source. 
the MIT license on the other hand allows someone else to take that code and incorporate it into your proprietary software or even commercialize it. But copyleft does not allow that. I know I'm, I'm simplifying it, but copyleft kind of forces you to make everything else open source. So if Google wanted to use some copyleft library in Gmail, they would have to make the entire Gmail open source, which they can't do. You know. There are a lot of issues with that. So that's why I, I'm thinking of using the MIT license for most of the Maybe that's a conversation for another group. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, the licensing is a very interesting, like, uh, and a very hot topic in open source because that's where, you know, I, people keep pointing fingers like this is better, that is better. So. So yeah, thanks. Any more questions? Any questions? Thank you.